continuing live coverage of the Synod of Bishops on the Family. We are in the last week of this Synod, but there is still so much to be done between now and Sunday's concluding Mass in St. Peter's Square. Over 300 participants from all over the world have been reflecting on the vocation and mission of the family in the church and in the contemporary world just behind me here in the Synod Hall. Today the small groups are holding their last meetings before handing their official suggestions to the commission that will draft the final document that will be given to Pope Francis for his reflection. At today's press conference, the results of the small discussion circles were summarized by Cardinal Wilfred Napier of Durban, South Africa, Cardinal Alberto Suarez Inda, Archbishop of Morelia in Mexico, and Luis Martinez Sistac, the Cardinal Archbishop of Barcelona. When asked if he had some concerns, the same concerns he had last year about the freedom of the Synod, Cardinal Napier had this to say. Let's listen. There were certain individual items that were of concern at the last Synod, and one in particular was the presentation of the interim report as if it had come from the Synod, as if it was part of the Synod's deliberation. And that was not true because we received the document about an hour after you guys had received it in the, the media. And we only then started re reading it. And that document was already saying things which I know were only said in the hall by two or th at the most two or three people. But it was presented as if they were the, um, the, the, the reflection of the Synod. Now that certainly gives you the impression that the Synod is being pushed in a certain direction. I also served on the commission that was uh, drafting the final document. And there were certain issues there where once again, they were being pushed in a certain direction. So in that sense that a particular ideology or agenda, whatever you'd like to call it, seemed to have been in operation. What was also nice to hear is that he emphasized that the prayer of the faithful for the Synod is vital and that he himself feels its impact. As a result of that, we would like, as a group of African bishops that are here at the Synod, to affirm, first and foremost, our appreciation to the many millions of lay people who are praying for the Synod, for the success of the Synod. I can say with, with a certain degree of, of certainty that we feel that those prayers are helping us through some difficult moments during the Synod. Other topics discussed at the press conference today included the simplification of the process of declaring marital nullity, cohabitation in Africa, and the accompaniment of marriages by older, experienced couples. But now I want to welcome my first guest today, Ashley Samuelson McGuire, a senior fellow at the Catholic Association. Ashley, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. You came to Rome just for this. I did. It's yes. a huge event. It is a huge event. Now, your contact, your uh, commenting on Catholic events and big media events a lot of a lot of times from the Catholic point of view what do you make of this synod so far as an observer yeah well there's a lot of complex things going on a lot of deep theological issues being discussed and debated and I think sometimes that doesn't always trickle down accurately to people um, but you know I think Cardinal Napier touched on something which is that there's a lot of goodwill there's a lot of people all around the world who are praying for the success of the synod and um, pe people are watching closely to see what's going to happen. Well, you're a wife and mother. How many children do you have? Your Two. husband have? Two beautiful children. Yeah. Um, what do you hope to see come out of this synod? I mean, well, you know, I think um, Archbishop Gomez of Los Angeles today in First Things, um, he said that his hope for the synod is one that I think is shared by um, young parents like me, which is to see the church, the beauty of the church's teachings reaffirmed. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of people who would love to see some practical things come out of the synod. I don't know if that'll happen. We don't know what that even could look like. Right now, right. it sounds, sounds so pastoral and theoretical. Right. But yeah. So, I mean, those are just two things that I would love to see happen. Um, and what do you think the main challenge is facing families? Because you're a mother yourself, and just looking at society in general, what do you? Th in the culture we're living in, what yeah. do you think are some of the biggest challenges families face? Because that's why they're here. Sure. Well, I think, gosh, there's so many. I know um, poverty is one. Um, it's not something we see so much in the United States, although it's certainly, certainly there, but in but other parts like in of other the world. Parts, right. um, but then, you know, in some of the more developed countries, I think contraception is a huge issue. I think mm. there's a huge lack of understanding and formation of couples 
as to that teaching and a misunderstanding that it's somehow oppressive. Mm. Um, but in fact, it's a very liberating and beautiful teaching. And again, that's something I think a lot of us are hoping to see the Synod Fathers affirm. Yeah, and it's hard to explain that, isn't it, to the, yeah. to the modern world that um, it's completely the beauty of, cultural. The, of sexuality is taught by the Catholic Church. Yeah. And it's liberating. You just said that freeing. It's not. Um, anyway, yeah, no, good point on that. What compelled you, though, to come to Rome for the Synod? You wanted to be here. Yeah, no, I mean, one thing that I do with the Catholic Association is, you know, when there's big events like this, is go and um, speak to the media to try and get some of the positive messages across. So, I mean, that's really why I'm here, is to um, help the Synod. I think, the, I think lay people have a responsibility to walk alongside the Synod Fathers and to help get the positive messages that they're hoping to reach people through the media out there. We have heard that time and time again at the press briefings with the Synod Fathers. They have said the role of the laity in this has been vital. Yeah. You've probably seen the youngest Synod Father, that little five-month-old Davi Day. There's a baby in the Synod oh. Hall every day. <laughs> that should be Ashley next time. Anyway, uh, so, but no, they have commented on and the important role that the laity have had. And they've talked about, what about if we had missionary families yeah helping new couples. I mean, you're new, just celebrated your fifth anniversary. Yeah. I mean, what about newlywed couples? What are those challenges for maybe people who aren't well, as well formed as you yeah. are in your faith? No, I think, again, the con there's a lot of concrete things that could be done. I have an article coming out about this. I think one thing that would be hugely helpful to newly married couples is some sort of diocesan program mm. that partners newly married couples with couples who've been married for decades. Um, even if it's just a friendship, it doesn't need to be something very structured, but just yeah. somebody to call with questions or just to be around to be reminded of mm -hmm. the positive things, you know, when you're in the middle of the day-to-day -day struggles. I think in America, probably worldwide, we don't live with our nuclear families anymore. Right. You know, before you, we used to just stay and you had the grandparents and the, you know, even down to the, to the grandkids. So, but yeah, as we move around the globe, this globalization, we're often torn apart from our families. So having this network, I think is something also that the Synod Fathers have discussed. I, I envision this becoming quite a catechesis on the family, incorporating what you just said. We need to, how can we walk with these families side by side? Could be a fruit of, of that. Um, what do you, how do you view Pope Francis's role in all of this? He called this synod. He yeah. called the extraordinary synod, which just means last year he said, I, I want to have a synod, <laughs> when it wasn't time to have one. He said, we have this extraordinary synod followed up by this second synod, so that he's leading the way on this. What does this mean? Yeah, I think he's, it's very clear that the issue of family is of utmost importance to him. That was the impetus for his visit to the United States. Uh, in almost every single speech he gave in the States, he talked about the importance of the family. Even in some of his other documents, Laudato Si, he talks about the importance of family and cultivating mm. a concern for the natural world. So it's, it's clear this is what he cares about, and I think that lay families feel very affirmed by that. What about the threat of religious freedom facing families? You work with the oh, Beckett yeah. Fund in the United States, which is a champion, like for example, with Little Sisters of the Poor, making sure that they can uphold their religious freedoms that are guaranteed in our Constitution. I mean, yeah. what about the threats facing families in that area? Well, one big religious freedom threat facing families is the rights of parents to educate their children. This is a huge issue in Europe. Um, where increasingly parents are, are being told they don't have the right to teach their children about their religious values. And it's trickling over to the states, and it's something that Pope Francis directly addressed in his visit. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's a big one to watch. Okay. What about, as we spoke about Pope Francis, and uh, what about his recent visit to the U.S.? Well, how would impact? You guys live in D.C., right? Yeah. Um, what was that like for you and your family? You know, it was busy, it was hectic, everything was shut down, but um, I think it was really great to see the energy, um, mm. the energetic response to his visit, because the narrative right now in the States is that religion is on the decline, that people are less and less religious, and you would never think that. How, how can they seeing, think that? I yeah. mean, I remember when he was going through Central Park, um, the TV commentators had to stop talking because it was deafening. You could not even talk over the noise. So I think it was a great rebuttal to that narrative, and, and especially to the narrative that the Catholic Church is not relevant. It's not true. <laughs> well, how do you think the American media, because I'm over here, I don't know, and but I, okay, through Twitter and whatnot, we're able to follow everything. But how do you think the message of the synod is being presented? Is it, are they yeah. kind of playing up to the jumbled mess side of it? Or are they like, listen, Pope Francis is looking for real solutions and 
what, how are they? I think there's a this little bit of both. Okay. I mean, I think there's a tendency in American media to be hyperbolic on both ends. Okay. And so that's always there. But I think there's been a lot of extraordinarily detailed, wonderful reporting from people like George Weigel, who, you know, if you actually take the time to read what's out there, okay. um, there's some really great detailed information. And I think generally the tone is positive one, but even George Weigel said, um, don't be Pollyannish. There's definitely some divisions going on. Definitely. Cardinal Napier just affirmed that. Um, but I think, I think it's been useful and helpful. And I think you're right. If you take the time to read what people are actually writing from this synod, um, and there's a more reasoned approach. Yeah. Yes, they are disagreeing with one another about important things, but that's what families do. And yeah. you know, even with their dad in the room, yeah. Pope Francis, they can still disagree. Why not? And yeah. I think there's a, actually been a great um, moment of catechesis through all of this. I mean, even if it's negative coverage, people are still reading articles about what the Catholic Church teaches and its unchanging teachings on marriage, on the dignity of man and woman. And so I think that's one really positive thing is that no matter what, people are being reminded of what the church teaches, including Catholics who yeah. need the reminder themselves. We need the <laughs> reminding too, yeah. And do you think that this, can you imagine what the Catholic Church's teaching sounds like in the world today? We, we grew up with it, right. but for the Catholic Church to be standing up 2,000 years later saying, one man, one woman, you know, no contraception for life. Um, this goes against the cultural grain. But you know, the bishops are also pointing out, we talk so much about divorce rates. We talk about the annulments and the community for divorce and remarriage. He goes, but actually there's a lot of great marriages out there, you guys. And we should be inspired by that and take what's good from that. So yeah, no, yeah. I'm a, I'm, like yours. <laughs> well, going. yeah, no, and I'm a convert and I, I'm somebody who, like a lot of other converts that I've met, were very attracted by the very bold countercultural yeah. stance of the church. So people want to be challenged, they don't do. they? They do. They don't realize it. And they, but I, I, can, I wonder if people think, why don't they just fold and give in? Yeah. Everyone else kind of seems to have, and the church is still saying, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> this is important and vital. Um, there was a cute story, I think, that a mutual friend of ours pointed out about when the Pope was there. I just wanted to get that in before you have to go, but um, that when the Pope was coming to town, um, he thought maybe he was going to come by your house, or... What is the story about? Maybe he thought the Pope might be your babysitter? Oh, yes. Okay, that's what it is. My daughter, my three and a half year old daughter. Oh, your daughter. Sorry, I got it wrong. Who's I got been it wrong. having a lot of babysitters when we go out on date nights? Yeah. Um, she was wondering why I was so interested in watching all this Pope coverage on TV, and she very sort of curiously walked up to me and said, Mommy, is the Pope going to babysit me? <laughs> it made me laugh because he would probably be a really great babysitter. <laughs> Well, stick around. Uh, we have to take a break, but stay tuned for more live coverage from the Synod in Rome. Welcome back to EWTN's coverage of the Synod on the Family live from Rome. I still have in studio with me my first guest, Ashley Samuelson McGuire, who is a senior fellow at the Catholic Association. Thank you for staying with us, Ashley. My pleasure. You mentioned before that uh, you were a convert to the Catholic faith, and so I think you're particularly poised to speak to other couples or in the, the world at large about, yes, it may seem strange what the Catholic Church is teaching, in, you know, in a world that's so liberated, let's say, in, in, a, in a way. Um, but have you found it challenging when trying to explain the church's message? I mean, I think you would be great at it. Yeah, I mean, there's always a challenge, but I do think that, you know, especially women, I think that women are maybe initially very startled by the church's teaching. I mean, I certainly was somebody who, when I first heard about some of these teachings, I was like, this is crazy. But then I started reading, and I think, I mean, you have to, it has to be presupposed by a certain openness. But I do think that um, there are certain voices out there who think that the Catholic Church would be 
more appealing to young people today if it were to relax its views. Mm. Um, and I think that is very much untrue. And even in my RCIA class, which was heavily female, a lot of young professional women, mm -hmm. all of us went out to dinner one night and agreed that it was actually the church's countercultural teaching on women's issues that captured our attention mm. in a positive way. I think because we see what society and the culture has actually done for women, and it's not, not good. <laughs> no, it's made things worse, but yeah. people don't realize that. And um, as soon as you try, there's an election year, it made, makes it seem like if you're on you know, the side of, let's say, if you're pro-abortion and you're pro all these things, that you're really on the side of women, which is right. doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so, but I think the bishops are discussing that too, you know, how to make the language, you brought up the language, you know, they're discussing how to take these very difficult teachings for some people to accept and hear and say, yeah. how do we make it more available, more accessible to people? And so they really, they do want to get these families together to accompany each other. Like, I think you and your husband would be more poised to talk about these issues than, you know, you know, Father Mike down the street, <laughs> you know? Well, so. yeah, and you know, I think an important thing is to just get the teachings out there. I saw a study um, done through the Ethics and Public Policy Center that found um, that a lot of women had never actually even heard or been exposed to the church's teaching on contraception. But when they did, especially there's, there's some kind of generational shift happening and younger women, millennial women, are significantly more open to and receptive to the teaching than prior generations. But how can you explain that? I mean, I think it has to yeah. be in part just a dissatisfaction with what the contraceptive okay. culture has done. So maybe they've tried all the world has to give and say, I think so. We're unhappier than when we started. Yeah, and yeah. I think, you know, there's an interest in sort of the idea of living a life that's free of contraception of yeah you know, hormonal interference or, or the, the, ge the general inequality of um, requiring the woman to be the one to alter her reproduction as opposed to the man. Right, we want to get into that, you know, all that, yeah. that there's so many issues there. We have to, it's often the burden of the woman. Right, and, which um, is unfair. Right. What do you think about Pope Francis? Because not only did, does he, is he worried about married couples living faithfully their bond and understanding that bond before they get married. They've talked so much about marriage preparation. Yeah. And he's also so energetic when he talks to the young people, yeah. saying, don't be afraid. Like, I, what about these millennials? Are they listening? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, um, you know, the numbers are very clear, at least in the states, that people are not getting married. Um, they're getting married a lot later. And I know anecdotally that people, especially women, are very afraid of marriage, as if it's something to be feared. Um, and this is... Is it the commitment, you think? The I, I, lifelong? I think it's okay. just a narrative okay. that people have sort of accepted without really thinking through this idea that your life ends with marriage. <laughs> and certainly marriage brings challenges, most pronounced of them children, but even that is something I think really needs to be pushed back on. And, and Pope Francis has got this really kind of exciting child he's he's presented marriage and having children as some sort of like rebellious act which is an interesting way to appeal to young people because young people like to be rebels yeah well they want to be rebels yeah in their dna that's, and, that's very smart of them. yeah <laughs> but he's saying don't be afraid to get married i think um i'm surprised you say that women are the one that are afraid to get married now that well, you would always I mean, think I it would be the other way they seem to be the, the ones dragging right. the guy down the aisle so i think speak. it's a concern about career that, it, that marriage will derail their career. Um, I, I've never understood that because to me it just seems logical that having a stable life partner would only help your career. Um, that's certainly been the case for me. And you know, children do present a challenge in terms of career, but I think a lot of women are increasingly finding that especially in a digital age, yeah. you can very much find ways to achieve both children and a work professional from home, life. Uh, work out of the office too. Some some workplaces are making it more welcoming to have children. I think um, some businesses or even or governments have stepped up more in um, helping families, assisting families that have children with in financial ways. Yeah. So that's good. But is there something more that the bishops, since they're gathered here just behind us, they're, they're just walking out of the Synod Hall right now for Chena. Um, what else can they do to make the teaching clear in your mind, as someone who comments on these things, more appealing to young people to, or say that married couple that's struggling to stay together yeah. after 10 years and, you know, three kids, what do you, what can they do? Because they're celibate men right. and <laughs> here's a real 
life problem here. Yeah. Well, I think a few things. I think um, one would be to encourage um, continued marriage enrichment classes after the wedding. I mean, Pope Francis... Okay, so um, post... Okay, okay. He, he made a comment that I thought was really striking and very refreshing when he said, you know, priests go through seven, eight years of preparation for something and they can still at the very end walk away. Right. Whereas couples get like three classes in a crowded, you know, yeah. s symposium hall and then it's like, there you go. There you go. Good and, luck. And by the way, you, you're you're in it for life. In it for life. Yeah. See you um, later. <laughs> so I think um, taking a close okay. look at marriage preparation and the idea of a continued mm. sort of marriage, like, and it fits with what Pope Francis keeps talking about, walking alongside yeah. people. Um, so that's one thing. You know, there's a lot of things. I think even uh, there's a lot churches can do, can do to accommodate families. Like at the just, parish level? To just okay. help them get to church. You know, there's okay. a lot of churches that don't um, have any kind of place for families to go. And I know that families with young children really struggle yeah. with mass. Um, with it's heroic. I see, you know, when you see them in there and, and their kids are usually so good, but you know, the mom's worrying the whole mass right. about the kids, you know, so yeah. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's another thing. Um, you know, I think making sure that these issues are, are clearly addressed in marriage preparation. Yeah. I think the challenge, again, is just getting the teachings through to people. Through to people. Um, yeah. And that can come through the priests. And when I mentioned earlier about uh, priests being celibate men and they may not be able to comment, they certainly can comment. And yeah. I remember reading a lot of Pope John Paul II on this, and he said, the question on whether a priest has the, say, the right even, or the church has the right to comment on such issues. He said the experience that is created in the confessional and by ministering to married couples is secondary, but no less real. And yeah. therefore, of course, the priest has to be involved in the process and can be a guide, you know, someone to accompany family. So a lot of people say, oh, what do the priests know? You know? Yeah. But I hear there's 270 bishops behind us uh, meeting to talk about that because they're pastors and married couples are souls and you're bringing souls into the world and here's our shepherds trying to help us out. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I agree. I think um, there's probably nobody who's better suited mm. to help married couples than priests because of what you said, what they've heard in confessionals, in yeah. marriage counseling. Um, you know, there's, I, there was an article on First Things that I thought was very powerful. It was about a young woman that I actually know um, talking about the first 18, year, 18 months of her marriage. And she said they almost divorced. And literally, <coughs> um, therapists Whoa. were advising them to separate because they just fought so much in the beginning. And she said it was the church and the um, counsel and friendship of priests that mm. kept them together. Maybe because the first option they didn't offer was separation and divorce. Absolutely. Like, oh, obviously you got into this too quick. Oops, you made a mistake. Easy peasy. No, and, and it was the churches um, knowing that the church firmly held the line on the permanence of marriage and the indissolubility of marriage that was sort of an anchor weight to them. That, and she said now they're happily married and have been for almost 10 years. You know, we're talking a lot about what the church Ha, can do for families, and I know you, you live in D.C. and you also comment on politics a lot. Um, do you see threats coming towards the family, let's say, from government, and should we be pushing back? Is this what Beckett Fund is, is trying to help with, like legislation against family life that's discouraging, let's say, family life? Yeah. Well, you know, I think, again, a big issue is the rights of, that where Beckett Fund really weighs in is on the rights of parents to parent according to their religious beliefs. That's something that's under threat. What about redefining the family? Like, oh, uh, yeah. This, I mean, the U.S. government, I mean, just talking about the U.S. government. Right. And, you know. Everything seems to be up for grabs. Definitely. And I think that started a long time ago. I think um, the idea that this is a recent development is not accurate. And okay. I think um, politically we need to go all the way back to square one and look at things like no-fault divorce. Um, okay. laws that, I mean, that radically redefined the meaning of marriage to suggest that you can walk away from it at any time, no at reason. any moment. I mean, yeah. it's harder to get out of a cell phone contract <laughs> than a marriage. But that, you're exactly right. That says something. Um, the throwaway culture that we have, even marriage is throwaway now. Um, one right. statistic that I saw that I found stunning was that 80% of divorces are unilateral, meaning one person is protesting and wants to stay married. I think it's an absolute scandal that you can enter into this, um, well, what we believe is a sacrament, but the government recognizes as a contract, right. and then just walk away 
even when your partner is protesting and you have children. I mean, what about responsibility to mm -hmm. children who are you know, the most vulnerable people in the relationship? Ashley, I hate that our time has come oh. to an end, and I'm so glad that I had you for the whole well, half hour. You. Um, how can we follow you on Twitter or social media? You can follow the Catholic Association on okay. Twitter and on Facebook. You can check out our website, and on my own Facebook, you can find me. I put a lot of my articles and writings up uh, there, you too. You have to follow her, folks. To, she's just amazing. That's our show for this evening. Remember, for all the latest information on the Synod, visit our special Synod page on EWTN.com. And follow us on Twitter at EWTN. Send us your questions and your comments using the hashtag EWTN Synod. We are covering this from all angles on EWTN News Nightly, Joan Lewis's blog and radio show, and the world over. For now, I'm Mary Shovlin. Good night from Rome. <laughs>